Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Esther. I am from the Central West Virginia al Group in Clarksburg, West Virginia. In October 1969, my husband and I had the occasion to attend Bill Wilson's last anniversary dinner. And when, during that weekend, we were in the coffee shop of the hotel, and Wallace walked in, and I told my husband, I said, there's Wallace. He said, are you sure? I said, yes, that's Wallace. And he went over to her, and he said, didn't I see you in Toronto in 65? And with that twinkle in her eye that only Wallace can get, she said, oh, probably did. And he said, well, go over there and straighten my wife out. And she said, I don't suppose there's anything wrong with you. <laughs> and he came back to the table with the most subdued look on his face that I've ever seen. <laughs> now, I think that was the first time anyone had ever said that to him, but I'll guarantee you it hasn't been the last. <laughs> and I fell in love with this lady. I was new in the al program, and I thought, this is my kind of people. So this morning, it is with very deep gratitude to the al Fellowship for the change it has created in my life that I want to welcome Wallace to West Virginia and the 38th Southeastern Conference and introduce you to Wallace W. Good morning, everybody. It is certainly great to be here with you all, and I can't tell you how much I thank you for carrying on this beautiful program that we have, that God and AA and so many other people, too, in AA have given to Elna. I think that gratitude is one of the symbols, I think, almost, of our fellowship. I hope it is, because we have so very, very much to be grateful for. And I particularly have more than anybody, I think, in this whole world. That's my cane, never mind. (laughs) to be thankful for. I had a wonderful husband, and I have the love of so many people. And I want to talk a little bit about that and about carrying the message on. You know, it's important to think it can't get started unless somebody takes the first step. Somebody makes a move. But the carrying on afterwards is really what makes a fellowship. If um, Bill had started the idea of Alcoholics Anonymous, and even if Dr. Bob had come in with them, if nobody carried it on, if what would AA be like? Nothing. And so it's the people that carry on through generation after generation, and I really feel sure that it will be carried on generation after generation. Bill was very, very optimistic about our three A's, AA, Alnon, and Alteen. And about the potential that they had in this world. And I think I'm even more optimistic. I really think that we can play a very large part in saving this troubled world from itself. So, as I say, 
I'm so grateful for your love and everything and devotion. But I think the emphasis should always be on the new people coming in, the people that are carrying it on. I think um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how AA started, and that, because AA was the embryo of Alan. Al Bill, <clears throat> as a young man, when we were first engaged, he never touched a drop of liquor. And I was so very proud of him. I thought, what willpower, what strength of character he has. Never to touch a drop of liquor. So, <clears throat> I was very, very surprised when after we were married, to go to New Bedford, Massachusetts, where he was stationed in the army during the First World War, and to go to a party <clears throat> and look around when it came time to go home for Bill, but no Bill, I couldn't find him. And I asked some of the boys about it, and he said, oh, we had to take Bill home some time ago. <laughs> So, I was quite surprised and, and disgusted and shocked, of course, when I got home and found him with a big bucket at his head. But <clears throat> I wasn't too worried in those early days because I thought that living with me would be such an inspiration. <laughs> that he wouldn't need the artificial stimulant of alcohol. <laughs> but years went on and on and on. And Bill's drinking got worse. Bill never drank socially. He always drank to the limit when he drank at all. There were many times that he didn't drink at all. But what he did, he was laid out completely at the end of it. And he thought at first, of course, that he could stop drinking any time he wanted. And I tried to make him want to stop drinking. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes he thought he wanted. Sometimes he wanted it. He wanted to please me, he wanted to make me happy, but he actually did not want to stop drinking. But then came a day when he did want to stop with all his heart and mind and soul, and he couldn't. He used to write in the Bible, which was the most sacred place he could think of, I promise you, my dear wife, this day, never to take another drop of drink from now on. And that would last maybe a week, maybe a few hours. And he would be drunk again. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and he, Bill really meant it this time, but I, I knew he did, and he couldn't. And so he lost, finally, he lost all hope. And I don't think there is a sadder sight in this world than somebody with such great ability and love in his heart could fall so low. I'd give up all hope. But that happened to Bill, and I had to make all the decisions. I had to be in contact with the outside world, the only contact with the outside world. I had to earn the living. 
I had to do everything. Bill was nothing but a sodden rag. So, <clears throat> that was a very heartbreaking situation. Somehow or other, however, I never did quite lose hope. There was always a little gleam somewhere, or would return after desperate hours, would return. I couldn't believe that such a thing could happen. So, <clears throat> finally, a miracle did happen, and it really takes a miracle or something as sick as Bill, somebody as sick as Bill was, to be made whole again. And when I went to see him after this wonderful miracle had happened, which I'm sure you've all read about in the big book, I knew that something tremendous had happened, that he was free at last. And I never had another doubt from that moment on. And he, he never had another doubt. And as it proved, he lived in many, many happy years after that. And you know about his friend coming to him and telling him about how he found sobriety in the Oxford group. The Oxford Group was an evangelical movement which lasted many years, and it was a worldwide movement. And <clears throat> it believed by changing individuals, you could change the world, and they were out to change the world. And it really did a lot of good. <laughs> and many of our principles and precepts in AA without on are taken from the Oxford group. And <clears throat> one day Bill said to me, let's hurry up and go to a meeting. Well, I had a shoe in my hand, I took that shoe and I threw it at him as hard as I could, and I said, damn your old meetings. <laughs> <laughs> This surprised and shocked me lots more than it did him. <laughs> Why had I reacted so violently to a simple remark of his? Here he was sober. I thought I was the happiest person in the world. I have a great ability to rationalize. I, Bill was not drinking. That had been my lifelong purpose, to help him stop drinking. And here he was now, free of liquor. If I wasn't happy, if I wasn't the happiest person in the world, why wasn't I? What was it? There must be something in me. It took me a long time to get down to that fundamental but I finally did. And then to ask myself, honestly, what of Bill's precepts of the early AA and all AA, of course, was to take an inventory. I had never thought to take an inventory. I had accepted myself, taken myself for granted that because I was well brought up in a moral, loving, very loving home, that my ideals were the highest, and that there was couldn't be any improvement on them. <laughs> <clears throat> and that my methods and ways were the right ones, the very best ones. I thought that maybe there was something that I did was not right that made him drink, 
but I couldn't figure it out, and I decided that that couldn't be so. But really, it took me years to work it out that I too needed to change my balance of qualities and, and um, to reassess my whole life. So in those early days after Bill and, <coughs> and Bob had um, started this wonderful fellowship and there were members in a few cities around. People had to go to a place if they wanted to start a new group. There was no literature. There was no way of spreading the message unless you went. You had to travel. So Bill and I did a lot of traveling in the old days, in the early days of AA. And we'd go to this place and that place, and Bill would talk to the men, mostly men, because there were very few women alcoholics that came out of them, out of the bedroom, we'll say, in those days. <coughs> and um, there were mostly men, and I'd talk to the women. And at first, these these gatherings that I had were kind of just social meetings. We might gossip about our husbands. <laughs> <laughs> or we might um, play bridge, even. And while Bill and the boys were having a meeting. But... <clears throat> As I became clearer and clearer in my own mind about my own needs, I began to tell the groups of families about it. And Addie Smith, who was also, she and Bob were in the Oxford group, she would tell the families about how she knew that she had to live by these same principles. And Addie, Addie Smith, um, we don't hear very much about her, but she was a, a marvelous person. And both AAs and non-alcoholics used to go to her and tell them all their troubles. And she, she was nearly blind she couldn't see very well. She'd sit in a dark corner of the room and smoke cigarettes. She was a chain smoker. One ash cigarette after another. But she was a very, very loving and wise human being. And as I say, AAs as well as their families used to come to her for advice. And she would, of course, tell them about her own discovery that she had to live by the principles of AA. So then, <clears throat> later on, as AA grew, grew, and of course there was literature published, and the general service office was set up, and <clears throat> a bill would work on the structure, the future structure, or the present structure that would be suitable for the future of, of this fellowship. And he spent much time and thought in reading how other societies were organized and formed and the principles under which they were being held together. And 
He tried to analyze it. He studied governments. He studied churches. He studied all kinds of different things. So he could... <coughs> excuse me. So he could get some idea of what would be best for this very unique society. It couldn't exist and, and grow with the ordinary organization of a of a, a society. It had to be something that fitted into the unusual temperament and situation of the alcoholic. So he spent a lot of time thinking about it and worked out this, which seems now as if it had been a very God-inspired uh, process, this structure that we have in AA, where there's no, no one body of people or one person that has any authority over anybody else. <coughs> the only authority is God, as we understand him. So, while he was doing this, he had, <coughs> he had come to the conclusion that, that AA needed a, a yearly conference, an annual conference of delegates from all over the country to come together and to oversee what was being done at the General Service Office. And it would be the delegates, thank you, the delegates' um, privilege to, um, to decide whether they thought that the, um, what had been done by the General Service Office and Board of Trustees was in the best interests of AA. So he went around the country, traveled around to get the opinion, to tell the groups about this idea and to get their opinion on whether they wanted to do it. And when he came back, <coughs> he told them, oh, when he came back, he told me that uh, <coughs> he had found, surprisingly to him, and, and also to me, a number of groups of the families of alcoholics. He hadn't realized that they had, that the families had gotten together um, for, sometimes they got together, as I said before, just to gossip. Sometimes they got together to put on the refreshments at a meeting. Sometimes if there was an AA clubhouse, they would hang up curtains in the AA clubhouse. And, but some of them had a fundamental purpose of helping themselves to live by the 12 steps of AA, as they had been adjusted to their own situation. So, I was surprised to hear that these, I knew that, uh, that a lot of them, families of alcoholics, were living that way, but I hadn't realized that they had formed these groups all over the country. So he asked me <coughs> if I would start a similar fellowship, excuse me, <coughs> if I would start a similar fellowship to AA for the families of alcoholics. So al is really an AA's idea. <laughs> <laughs> and a darn good and important idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so, <clears throat> when he asked me if I had sought such a fellowship, I didn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> Our first years in AA had been very, very, very busy. We'd had a wonderful time. I mean, we'd felt needed and useful. But we hadn't had a real home of our own. There were two years where we went around, I think it was 51 different places we stayed in these two years, living with other AAs because we didn't have any home of our own, we didn't have any money. I'd stop. Bill had been saying for a long time, I want to get Lois out of that damned apartment so. <laughs> and finally he did. But, so there wasn't any real income. <clears throat> <clears throat> so we had gotten a home in 1941 and it was such a joy to me it was a home in the country not too far from New York about 40 miles from the city and I was having such a glorious time in the garden I just loved flowers and getting my hand in this in the soil and weeding, that um, I didn't want to take the time away from this home that we have. But it wasn't very long before I figured out that, that, and really felt very deeply that this was something very much more useful and important, and I wanted to do it. So I called a friend, a neighbor, a girl by the name of Ann Bigham, <coughs> who, by the way, had been going, or who had formed a, a group of families in her area. She lived about eight miles from us. In her area, a, a group of the families. And um, she was thrilled to do it, and she came up to our house at Stepping Stones to help me one day a week. And we wrote to a <coughs> AA and asked them if they had any names of the families of alcoholics. If they had, would they send them to us, please? And to our surprise, they gave us 87 names. And we wrote to those 87. And we asked them if they would like to form a fellowship of the families of alcoholics, similar to AA. And there were 50 of them. And we, we got back answers from 50 saying they would love to do it. So Alvon really started with a nucleus of 50 groups all over the country, which is really, I think, a surprising number of, of groups to start with. And then it began to grow. And we asked, we sent out questionnaires continuously asking this fellowship if they wanted to well, form a fellowship like AA, if they wanted the name to be out on family groups, and <coughs> the principals say, <coughs> I'm sorry, the same as AA. And they said they would. <coughs> so we got to be so busy that we had to move to New York. And we went around, we found some groups in the neighborhood down on Long Island and, and Jackson Heights and several different places around, up in Connecticut. And um, 
we asked for volunteers down in New York, and the AAs up there in our neighborhood were, have always been very good, kind and thoughtful. And they had the AA clubhouse on, 20, on West 24th Street. And they offered us the um, upstairs room, the use of it for our meetings. So we started in with about five alarms down there. This was in, in 51. Alan on them opened, well, it was 51 that Ann came up to my house too. But this was just uh, the end of the year. And we, we started there. And we had all kinds of interesting experiences, of course. And the place was freezing cold in winter and hotter than Hades in the summer. So it was either Lois's sweatshop or Lois's icebox, <laughs> they call the uh, room upstairs. But we had some very marvelous gals who helped us, and so many of them as have gone, but some of them are still around, of course. And that's really the way Alamon got started. And it continued to grow, grow and grow and grow. Of course, it had AA ahead of it, so it grew very fast. Also, the poten potential for growth in Alamon is, I don't know, about 50 times, I would say, greater than um, in AA because the number of, of people associated with an alcoholic are so great. The families, the grandparents, and the children, and the cousins, and the, and the employees, and the teachers, and all kinds of different people that are associated with alcoholics can join in the into in Alabama. So with this really terrific chance that Alabama has, I don't think there are any limits to which we can go. And as I said earlier, I really believe that our three A's have a chance to change for the better this troubled world. I thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We all thank you for your constant love and dedication to the Al Anon Fellowship for the past 31 years. I think your message of hope shines for the millions of us all over the world whose lives have been affected by the disease of alcoholism in a loved one. I hope that your visit with us today and your inspiring words will let us all feel the responsibility of carrying that light to the millions still out there in darkness and despair. Thank you again. Well, thank you very much. Because we love you so much in West Virginia, West Virginia Alamans wanted to give you a love gift. We thought we thought, and we finally came up with something that we feel that maybe will help you to remember us as we remember you daily. 
and I would like at this time for Mary Jo to come and present this gift. I always feel that the artist ought to get to present the masterpiece, so I'll call on Mary Jo. Oh my! <laughs> I am Mary Jo from Saint Albans, made with love, as I made it, and it represents all of the Alamans from West Virginia. I love you. Oh, thank you so very much. <laughs> Look what you've got to carry. I'm going to, I'm going to read you the card. There's a big, great big card. And the parcel itself is huge. <laughs> and the card goes on. See, see the card. <laughs> For this special occasion, we decided that all of us should pitch in and buy you this gift. Your share comes to $1.50. <laughs> differently in West Virginia, Lois. Um, all of our love, all the alamans from West Virginia, best wishes. So all the animals are singing. And there's a hoary looking uh, poison uh, animal, uh, a lion. Yes. <laughs> we roar a lot. Yes, that accepts the parcel. May I ask Barry to help you with this? No, don't come in. I love that too, so it comes to down fifty. I'm sorry, I neglected to introduce the gentleman on Lois's right. He is Barry L. from New York, and he travels with Lois and helps her on and off planes and does all those nice things by pushing her wheelchair and protects her. <laughs> cold after this. <laughs> it's marvelous. <laughs> Thank you so very much, Mary Jo, and all the rest of you, for your share of it, I'm sure. You're going to pay your, you're going to pay your dollar and a half, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what if I were <laughs> I'll have to give her change. She's a big spender. We're not quite through yet. We still have one more small gift that I'm going to ask Janet from St. Albans to come and present to you. <laughs> I'm Janet. I'm grateful out from Alan from Winfield. And I just want to give this to God. <laughs> <laughs> God bless you, and thank you for changing your mind. <laughs> oh, thank you. I, I'm overcome. This is so pretty. I hate to spoil it. <laughs> But he waits with bated breath. <laughs> Reminds me of a wedding shower. Um, I can't get.
get over a second, a second present. Oh, this is. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it says, Dad, you're all meeting. The shoes. <laughs> I'm not sure. Want me to hold it right here? There's a picture of a shoe and it's a flying through the air. Isn't that cute? It says, Damn Your Old Meetings, June 1982, and it has a little old fashioned shoe. <laughs> Very cute. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.